Hi folks, <clears throat> so I was quite controversial there in that first part of preaching and preaches. So I'm just telling you how I feel about preaching. I know that I'm controversial in what I'm saying. I know it's it's confrontational in the way I'm talking. But when you're fed nonsense, when when it's all nonsense, you have to say that it's nonsense. It's no good beating about the bush, and it is nonsense. It's it is it is it is a sham that I know for sure, and I can testify in my own experience. I was I I I went to two theological seminaries. One that claimed to be evangelical and was not evangelical. But there were seminary professors there, or seminary lecturers there, that did not believe in inerrancy, and yet they claimed to be evangelical. So I'm talking from experience. And I saw the devastation that that did to a whole generation of young people. And I saw the devastation that it did to a denomination in the UK, in the Nazarene Church in the UK. I saw it with my own eyes and I saw these young people going into evangelical churches and I saw that they were confused, that they didn't really know what they were talking about. And I went to another seminary where it was four seminaries in one and I saw again with my own eyes the hypocrisy of the mainline denominations, the Baptist, Methodist and Anglican, training the ministers, when I could see the lecturers were 100% opposed to evangelicalism, let alone weak on inerrancy. I mean, they were literally opposed to evangelicalism. The evangelicalism was a dirty word. So I'm speaking from experience. Now I know that there are some seminaries in the UK and in America, but those seminaries are few and far between compared to the vast majority of seminaries. So I've said a lot there. What I wanted to say basically is we need to get back to the Bible. We need to get back to the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we'll read a few scriptures now. And and it's about being a man of God, seeking what God wants in your ministry, hearing what God wants you to do in the ministry. And um, Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. It is written, I will be destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of the world. For after this in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Preaching is at the heart of the church. Preaching is at the heart of the church. And if you don't believe that then you're... You, you're, you're You've got a problem with true Christianity. True Christianity is spread by preaching. People say, oh, it's spread by signs and wonders. Yes, God does signs and wonders. But it's through the preached word. Pentecost came when the word of God was being preached. People came and were convicted of sin because of the preached word. And it's the preached word of God. And if you don't believe in preaching, you don't believe 
in the centrality of preaching in your church, then your church isn't going anywhere. I don't care what church you have, it's not going anywhere at all. Um, and everything is mitigating against preaching in the church. Preaching is being sidelined in the church. You know, people are putting more worship songs on. People are, it's, it's more worship. Um, it's more entertainment. Uh, children's services more uh, anything and anything but let's don't have preaching and if we have preaching let it be just for five minutes it's, it's frowned upon for someone to preach a good sermon at an evangelistic meeting and if that's the case then that's really really bad and you should be ashamed of yourself as a church and as a preacher if you're ashamed to preach a 45 minute message or a 30 minute message evangelistically in your church if you're ashamed of that at a special rally or a special evangelistic meeting then there's something wrong with you there's something seriously wrong with you and your church you are heading for disaster and preaching has throughout the history of the church preaching has been at the center we 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 went into the first video we I talked a lot about the early church fathers. Um, the Middle Ages was a time of where uh, preaching was was uh, not seen as important. It was more philosophical discussion, and the church was not as on fire as it should have been in that middle age period because it got sidetracked by apologetics by talking about uh, Aristotle and things like that um, you had in the 14th century you had Huss uh, you had before him in the UK you had uh, the Lollard preachers uh, you had in the Reformation you had preaching going on all over the place Luther was a great preacher Calvin was a great preacher uh, many of these reformers were great preachers of the word Luther spent week after week lecturing on the Psalms lecturing on the book of Romans Calvin spent time after time preaching through many books of the Bible if you want to see sermons on Job it's like that and it was that preaching that made the Reformation the way it was. Um, in the 1600s, you had the Puritans. Uh, you had uh, Richard Baxter at Kidderminster. who preached and visited his congregation. You had Richard Sibbs. You had uh, Thomas Watson, um, John Owen, John Bunyan. Uh, and all a whole army of um, what's it there? He had a whole army. I was just looking for an old Puritan book I'm preaching. He had an all army of Puritans uh, who preached the word of God and were used mightily. They would spend weeks, months, just going through one passage of Scripture and expounding on it. Uh, Greenall or Green Hill. Uh, series on uh, Ezekiel by the Bible of Truth <laughs> it's like tons of sermons just on the book of Ezekiel um, they wrote a lot of pastoral books because of their preaching and the Puritans were giants in terms of uh, expository preaching teaching the Bible systematically they did a great work and they were used mightily by God then you had the 17th century, you had Whitfield um, from Bath, uh, who went to Oxford, and uh, John Wesley, and there were minor other preachers around, like in Yorkshire, Nelson, um, and, and um, what's his name? I uh, can't remember his name, but there was a preacher over where the Brontes were, prior to the Brontes being there, um, Brontes were writers, but in the area where the Brontes lived, there was a preacher 
I can't remember his name, someone will remember. And, and there was, in the 1700s, there was preachers. Nelson got arrested. John Nelson got arrested for preaching uh, in Yorkshire. And his wife went to see him. And as she went to see him, a mob went up to uh, beat her up. She was pregnant at the time. She lost the baby. And there was, in the time of Wesley, uh, he would go around preaching. People would run him out of town, throw bottles at him, throw stuff at him. Um, Whitfield would stand in the open air and preach. Countess of Hunton was converted. She used her wealth to pay for chapels for Whitfield to preach in. Uh, Whitfield went to America. He preached there. Wesley went to America, come back. Um, there was uh, Jonathan Edwards in America, a uh, philosopher. He preached and uh, saw great work uh, through his preaching. Then you had the 18th century, and you had um, Spurgeon, you had many, many uh, great preachers. You had um, the Haldanes in, in um, Scotland, and you had all sorts of great preachers in the 19th century. What is it? 18th century, well 1900s, not 1800s, sorry. Um, you, ha you, had, um, you had a whole army of them. And um, you had D.L. Moody come, he was a preacher, he came to the UK. He was mightily blessed, he had an, an anointing experience um, before he went preaching. You had Branlow North in Scotland, who was a great preacher. And it was through preaching that the church spread in the 1800s. And in the 19th century, you had some great preachers. You had um, Campbell J. Morgan, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, some great Keswick preachers uh, like Scroggy, a lot of brethren preachers at the time. Um, you had some great preachers in the 50s and 60s, both on both sides of the Atlantic. You had uh, Barnhouse, Vernon McGee, um, James Montgomery Boyce, and many, many others. And today we you have people like John Piper, John Bunyan, uh, John MacArthur, and uh, there are some preachers today. But throughout the history of the church, it's been preaching at the centre of the history of the church. Whenever the church is going to get blessed, whenever it's going to grow, there will be preaching at the centre of the work. Okay? So if preaching is not at the centre of it, then there's something wrong. There's just something wrong. Now, I want to... So that's the history of preaching, a little spotted history. Um, just to show you why it's central. So I just want to talk about pitfalls about that. One is histrionics. You know, if you're a young man, the temptation is when you hear that history and you read the books about Whitfield's diary, you want to read a book on preaching, read Whitfield's diary, that will blow you away. But if you read these books and you read about it, th there's a danger you can get an egotism histrionics where you want to see your church grow like Spurgeon's did or Whitfield but a lot of it's about your own ego a lot of it's about you wanting to be the centre of the work and it's all about you wanting to be made significant so you want to just realise that that's a problem and ask God to deal with it and God will deal with it if you ask him but when he deals with it you're not going to be happy the way he deals with you when he puts you under the knife you're going to cry out Lord stop 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 yeah but there will be a, a part of you that when you hear that history and you see the importance of preaching there will be a part of you that wants to be this you, you, you kid yourself you'll say oh I want to bring glory to God I want to bring glory to the congregation 
but a lot of it really is just about you wanting to be the centre of the tension, centre of the ministry. But God is gracious, he knows you've got these false motives and he knows you're genuine and sincere at the same time. So what he'll do is, he'll wait for a time where you ask him to make you into the preacher that you want to be. That's when he puts you under his knife. That's when he begins to cut you down. When he starts to cut you down, you're not going to, it's not going to be nice. You're not going to be smiling. You're not going to be laughing. You're not going to be happy. Because when he starts to cut you down, he, he will cut you down. He will cut every bit of pride in you that you have. If you think you're proud now, you don't realize, you don't even know how proud you are. You are so proud that you make the devil look innocent. That's how proud you are. But you don't know that now. You, you recognize in yourself, oh, I'm a little bit proud. But you have no, absolutely no idea how right at the deep part of your heart there is a little iron ball of pride that no matter what God would do to break you, you'll still have that pride. You've got a lot of pride. And it's an iron ball core of pride. And that is what God has got to get rid of. And so he, he begins to cut away your pride. He'll make you fail. Well, he won't make you fail. He'll let you fail in your ministry. And he'll let things happen to you that will crush you. And you, you begin to realize that, hey, I'm actually nothing. When that day dawns on you, that you're apt, that actually you are absolutely nothing. When that day dawns on you, it's kind of like a cold bath. Imagine you just get up in the morning and someone fills the water, the bath up with the cold water, throws you in the bath, and it's freezing. When it finally dawns on you that you're a nobody and a nothing. And you can be in a church and there can be 300 people there and you're preaching away. But one morning you wake up and you realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm absolutely nothing. When you realize that, it's the most frightening and the most liberating experience you could ever have. Because that's the time when you've you, you're beginning to walk in the way of an Irenaeus. That's the time when you're beginning to walk in the way of a Polycarp or an Ignatius. That's the time when you're beginning to walk the way God meant you to walk. The time when you talk about, I don't fear men. I don't fear men as a preacher. I don't fear what they say. I don't fear what they do. I'll just preach for God. But, fact of the matter is, there's a lot of pride there. A lot of false motives that you haven't seen in your preaching and your ministry. So God puts you under his Bunsen burner, Bunsen burner and he, he begins to cut you down. Because you prayed, Lord, make me a preacher like Spurgeon. So God said, okay, you want to be a preacher like him? Well, you've got to be like him. You've got to be like him. You gotta have no pride. You're gonna have no pride, I gotta cut it out of you. So God takes you through experiences, lets you go through experiences where you come out and you realise that you are absolutely nothing. And you realise that you were full of pride, but not only full of pride, there was a rock solid part of you that was so proud that nothing on this planet could have got rid of that pride unless God let you go through the experiences that you have gone through so that that pride would be finally demolished in your life and then when he's demolished it in your life then he can begin to mould you into his image he can begin to mould you as a preacher he can begin to mould your ministry He, sorry about that. He can begin to mould you and, and use you 
in a way that he wants to use you, not the way you think you should be used. And that way is a painful way. It's a painful way. Because God's way is not man's way. God's way is that he will use you but hide you. Yeah? He will use you but he will hide you. What do I mean by that? You see, when God does a great work in a man, he uses them but he hides them. What do I mean? Well, God's going to do, when he takes that pride out of you, and you're left empty and desolate and wondering what's going to happen, how am I going to cope, where's he going to lead me, what's he going to do, when he takes you to that point, he then begins to use you. But the most frustrating thing is, is that it's not in the eyes of what people are expecting. It's not in people looking on and saying, oh, our pastor's done that great work. Our pastor's done a great sermon. Our pastor's done this. Our pastor's done that. You'll be doing a great work, but that people won't see it. God will hide it from them. And every every now and again, God will show you what He's doing through you. He'll just open the curtain a little bit. I I'll give you an example. I was uh, I'll give you an example. I do a lot of street preaching. Now. I've been going to universities and we reach thousands of students, literally thousands. We've re literally reached thousands of students. Very few people know the work that's gone on. There's nobody there to look on and say, oh, they've reached thousands of students. Or oh, in that ministry, great. Because nobody really knows about it. We don't boast about it. We don't tell anybody about it. Unless people ask us. At the same time, God encourages you because I remember a few weeks ago meeting a, a Muslim guy and I gave him a DVD of, and I gave him a tract and, and a, a, a gospel in Arabic and um, thought nothing of it and a few weeks later we went back to this city Liverpool University and one of the evangelists I was with he was talking with this guy and the evangelist said come here Jay so I came over he said this guy wants to talk to you you gave him some literature of last week or week before and I've never seen a guy so hungry for the word of God and he said you gave me a DVD you gave me an Arabic uh, gospel it was beautiful and uh, I'm a Muslim, but I, 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 I know that Christ died on the cross, but I don't understand it. I want to know more. And I was astounded. I thought, I could see the Holy Spirit at work in this man. And I felt that God was saying, look, your work is not in vain. God, you, I, I am working in your ministry. And it really thrilled me. It really encouraged me. But it's a work that's hidden. Even though I've told you it's not going to be known in the circle. I'm not saying it so people recognise what I'm doing. I'm just telling you this to encourage you. That my ministry in that area of ministering to students, nobody knows about. But yet, God opened a little door and just said, look, I'm working, I'm using you. And it'll, it'll be the same as you as a pastor. As in your ministry as a preacher people will look on and think I don't think much of that preacher but yet every now and again God will bring someone in your life and they'll say you know you know last year at Christmas when you preached that message at church that's when I got converted and God I will just let you see a little bit of what he's doing in your ministry and all the time you'll be frustrated. Lord, why don't they recognise what I'm doing for them? Why don't they recognise 
the, the, the pastoral visits that I do? Why don't they recognize uh, the, the anointing that comes on me when I'm preaching? Can't they see the anointing? Why don't they understand that you're at work? Because God's hiding it from them. So you don't get glory. So you don't get tempted to puff, be puffed up with pride. That's God's way of dealing with preachers who he's going to use greatly. It, 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 it's the hide and reveal. It's hide you from the world and the church. Most of the church, the sub, one or two will recognise what you do, but not most of them won't. Hide them from the church. Hide my preacher from the church. Hide my preacher from the world. But I'll give my preacher a little encouragement every now and again, showing what I'm doing through through him. But that's God's way to keep you humble, because you have more pride in you than you could even believe. So, and I, I go for myself. I, I, that's my own experience, as well, you know. But search your own heart. But when you pray that prayer, Lord, make me a preacher like Spurgeon. Be very, very careful what you pray for, because you have no idea what you're going to go through. You have no idea. The amount of work that God has got to do to get you to be that preacher. He's got to break you. He's got to make you. He's got to cut away every bit of pride in you. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. You're going to go kicking and screaming. You're going to go kicking and screaming. Lord, I can't cope with the knife anymore. I can't cope with the knife anymore, God will say. But you prayed you wanted to be a preacher for my times. You wanted to be a preacher for the nation. That's what you prayed, didn't you, yeah? Well, I'm going to do it through you, but I'm going to cut you down, boy. I'm going to cut you down. And Lord, I can't take it anymore. That woman over there, she's upset me in the church. She's hurt my pride. Yeah, but I'm going to cut you down more, boy. Well, that church got rid of me for... For, for saying uh, I weren't preaching properly and they've got rid of me for not preaching the gospel properly this, this didn't happen to me by the way so don't think it happened to me I'm just pretending and, 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 it, and, it's, and it's not going right Lord I've, and, and, and they've got rid of me and I haven't got a manse anymore and they took a salary away from me and the Lord said you wanted to be a preacher to the nation yes I do Lord well I'm cutting you down boy I'm cutting you down I'm taking your pride out boy Lord, I can't take it no more. I can't take it. I've lost my ministry. I've lost my reputation. I've lost it all, Lord. Yeah, but I'm cutting you down, boy. I'm cutting you down. Lord, I, I, I'm doing this now. I'm, 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 I'm giving out newspapers in, in the town. And I, I should have been a minister in a church with the thousand congregation and preached the word of God. I'm cutting you down, boy. I'm cutting you down. And then... You get down on your knees and say, Lord, I can't cope no more, Lord. I wanted to be a preacher for the nation. And and all this has happened to me. And it's all gone wrong. And I'm finding it hard. And I can't cope. And it's no good. And I stir my head. And, Lord, I can't cope. And the Lord is saying, you're nearly ready, boy. There's just a little bit more pride. A little bit more pride. Lord, I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more, Lord. It's too hard. It's too hard. It's too hard, Lord. It's too hard. You're breaking me too much, Lord. You broke me too much, Lord. I can't take it. I can't take it no more. I don't put me through any more of this. I don't want no more of this. The Lord said, I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to make you the preacher for the nation. I'm going to make you a man of God. I'm going to make you a preacher for the word of God. I'm going to make you a preacher. And I'm taking you through this. And we're going to get rid of that last bit of pride. Even though it's going to cause you pain. And even though you're going to scream, scream, scream. That pride is coming out of you, boy. He said, Lord, I don't want it to come out of me anymore. You broke me too much. I can't cope with it no more. I know I wanted to be a preacher for the nation. I know I wanted to be a prophet for the nation. I know I wanted to preach the word of God with the fire of God. But Lord, this is too much. I can't cope. It's crushing me. And the Lord says, no, no, no. You want to be a preacher for me? 
I will have no pride in my presence, boy. I hate pride. And I have no pride in my way. And you be a man of God. But you be a humble man. A man who walk with humility. A man who knows that he's nothing without me. A man who knows that he can't even walk. He can't even talk. He can't do nothing without me. And then when you walk and when you talk, you will walk and you will talk in the Holy Spirit and in the power of God. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm just telling these folk here about preaching. Sorry. <laughs> and you will walk and you will realize you will realize that you can do nothing, absolutely nothing, without me. Because I am that I am. I am the living God. And I'm the God who made Moses. I'm the God who made Elijah. And I'm the God who gives glory to me and no other. And if you're going to preach in my name, you're going to preach for my glory and not yours. You're going to walk in my power and not yours. So you prayed. You wanted to be a preacher of the nation. Well, we're going to make you a preacher of the nation. Well, when I've made you a preacher of the nation, it'll be all of me and nothing of you. Have you got that? Lord, I can't take it no more. But I'll do whatever you want. This last bit of pride that you're taking out of me. is hurting so bad Lord. That I'm in tears. And I cry day and night. Say Lord I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. I can't take it no more. But if you can make something of me Lord. If I can be a man of God for you, Lord, and put that last bit of the knife in, Lord, take that pride away. But I know, Lord, that it ain't going to happen with me. It's going to be going to happen with you. And the Lord will show no mercy. He'll take his preacher. He'll put him under the knife. And he makes sure that last bit of pride is gone. Then you're ready to be his man. God is calling people to be preachers of the word of God. Is he calling you? You've been given a great task. And I'm going to talk about how to do the practical of the task first of all know that you're called you are called to be a preacher and it's God who calls you not man but God he calls you in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. God ordains his men. He ordains them. God ordains them. You've been called, you've been called of God. You are God's man. You're God's man. You're not the church's man. You're not your denomination's man. You're not your wife's man. You're God's man. You're God's man. When God calls a man, he's God's man. You need to know whether you're called to the ministry. You will know whether you are called or not. You will have the divine seal of God upon you. And you will know that you are called of God. 
There is a seal upon a preacher, what God puts on, and that seal is in the heart. Every preacher knows that they are to preach the word of God because they have a burning desire to preach the messages of God. They have a burning desire to build the church of God up. They, sat, they are sad to see the church and the walls of Zion broken and they have a hunger to build the church of God and to shepherd the flock. Every preacher has this hunger and burden upon them. It is God given that they will see the need for the church to be built up on the word of God and it never leads them night or day they have this desire to build the people of God in the word of God and no matter what happens to them what they go through no matter how discouraged they are this hunger to defend the gospel to preach the word is always there even when they are depressed it never goes this call is a call that is put upon you it's a mantle that God gives you and once it's on you, it's on you. You cannot shirk it off. You cannot push it off. It's there. It's divine given. No man, no nation, nothing can take it away from you. It's what God has given. You have to do two things. You have to walk in the confidence of what God has done in your life. That he has given you this call. It needs to be confirmed by others. It, you cannot do without the church the church is there to confirm your call but if the church is not functioning the way it should be and not hearing what God is saying then God will still have his man so the church is involved in confirming your call but you yourself will have it in your own life you will know that you are called it will be a burden that you cannot shift it will be something inside you that you know you have to do come what may it'll be something that you feel that you cannot do it'll be something that will frustrate you torment you it'll be something within you that you know no matter what you have to teach the word of God and you will not be happy until you teach that word And it's God that's called you to do the work. And so the call is the foundation. It's based on your relationship with God as your Father. He loves you. He wants to bless you. And as He has called you, let Him work your call out. Don't you try to work it out. When you pray, make me a Spurgeon, that's not a good prayer to pray. Make me a man of the nation is not a good prayer to pray. Make me the man you want me to be, Lord. Let me do what you want me to do, Lord. That's a good prayer. And so when God has called you, you need to let him work out your call for you, not you will n have no end of frustration in the ministry and frustration in your ministry if you do not let God work it out. If you're working it out, what you should be doing, working it out, how you should do it, you're going to be frustrated. Just be quiet and let God work. Let God guide you. Let God show you how His ministry is to be done where his ministry is to be done let him show you if there are times that seem to be unsure where God is leading you in the ministry let us say that you're wondering whether you want a denomination to accept you in the ministry or you're wondering whether to go to this church pastorate or that church and there seems to be a time where God doesn't seem to be speaking to you. God doesn't seem to be hearing your prayer and it seems like brass. The reason why that is, is because God is saying something even in the silence. You see, if it seems to be like three months, six months, that the denomination is discussing about whether you should be in the ministry or not, or 
it seems like six months before you get an opportunity to preach and in that silence you think well has God forgotten me no the silence God is saying a lot in the silence in the silence God is saying prepare yourself in the silence God is saying you're not ready yet there's some issues you need to deal with in the silence God is saying the things that I've got you to do at the moment that you think are not important are very important to what I'm going to be doing with you in the future in the silence God is saying trust me even though you cannot see or hear what I'm saying and doing at the moment and it seems to be a dark path trust me trust me because if you're going to go in the ministry if you're going to be a preacher you're going to have to trust me so trust me now trust me in the dark now because it's going to get dark sometimes in the ministry so you need to trust me in the darkness in the ministry so trust me now so in the silence God is speaking so don't get frustrated in the silence in your call when you're called to the ministry and you feel called and people aren't recognizing the call or you're wondering where to go how to go what to do and it and God seems to be silent and not saying and leading as you hoped and your hopes and dreams don't seem to be turning out the way they are that's a time just to be quiet just to relax just to base your relationship on God not just on your call but on your relationship that is your father that he he is your father that he is your father that he loves you because in a way that is going to be the strength of your ministry it's going to be the strength of your preaching that you know that God is your father you see a lot of the preachers, a lot of the pastors and preachers that I've seen and I know in my own life we use the ministry to deal with our psychological issues God knows that and he understands that he doesn't condemn us for it but a lot of us are in the ministry and we have a lot of psychological issues to deal with the way our fathers or mothers treated us the way things have gone in our lives and we're we're taking those issues and we're trying to work these psychological issues in the ministry and and it and the way to deal with those psychological issues is in that silence where you're wondering where God is leading sometimes is to come back to the fact that you have a relationship with God that he is your father to get back to that relationship so you're, you're called of God but it's the foundation of the call is the fatherhood of God that God loves you that you're his child and in that silence you can relax and, and be at peace and know that he'll lead you and too often we get stressed out about is God leading me does God want me in the ministry should God let me will, can can I do this can I do that does God want me to do this does God want me to do that and basically it's anxiety because we want to get on we want to be accepted we want to we want to uh, be appreciated we want there's all these other issues but deep down the problem is that we have to relax and know that he loves us and know that he, he he's our father and he cares and that even though it's a dark time where we wonder which way are we going he cares and he'll guide us and he'll lead us and he'll show us the way so we've got to get back to the fatherhood of God that we are his children and that he cares and that so we 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 realize that we're called but we realize that our call is based on our relationship with God we are children of God at the end of the day and it's that that is that heart that is at the heart of your ministry and your preaching ministry and your pastoral ministry is that you know that you're secure in the love of God through Christ that has to be the heart of your ministry that is should be the heart of the ministry that is the heart of your ministry is the fatherhood of God 
Uh, if we turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5 verse 8, But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God commendeth his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loved you when you were a sinner, so he loves you now, and he's not going to abandon you, he's not going to let you down, he's not going to disappear, he's not going to fail you, he's, he's looked after you before, and he's going to look after you now. And he's demonstrated his love to you and he loves you and he, and he cares for you and he's going to be there for you in your ministry. For God demonstrates his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he's living in that love of God, knowing that God loves us, knowing that God cares for us, is the basis of anybody's ministry, especially preaching ministry and pastoral ministry. And what happens is we forget that we for, we will as we go on in our call as we go as we go through that darkness into the ministry where God calls us that unsure period and we go into the church or whatever sorry whatever God calls us to in in ministry then excuse me then problems arise in our marriages in our ministry excuse me, because we've lost sight or we don't understand or we, we haven't been able to, excuse me, incorporate that basic foundation that God loves us. If we, if we could imbibe that, if we could get that into our system that God demonstrates his love to us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. If we got that into our system we wouldn't make the mistakes that we made. That's why I've made many mistakes on the internet and mistakes in ministry is because deep down I've not understood or don't appreciate as much as I should or allowed it to impact me that God loves me and because God loves me he wants the best for me and I can relax in that and as I relax in that I'm not going to get upset I'm not going to get frustrated I'm not going to react in the flesh whether it be to the wife, or whether it be to someone in the church, or whether it be someone in the on the internet, some atheist who winds me up, or whatever. But if we can appreciate that, you know, God loves me, and he's in control, and he'll guide, and he'll lead, and he cares, and it's all alright. And so, as Jeremiah was called, and as you were called in ministry, and as there is a time of unsureness of where to go in your ministry, as a preacher that's a time where God is speaking and he's speaking principally he wants you to realize that your ministry is not ultimately built on your call your ministry is ultimately built on this relationship that you have with God that you are his child and that he loves you so when you go into your preaching ministry you're not going to be a problem a lot of preachers, a lot of ministers go into the ministry and they cause more problems than they solve. For example, a lot of Calvinistic reform preachers can go into ministry, they can be cold and logical and they can expound the word and they're very hard in pastoral care. And a lot of it is because maybe their father or one of their parents didn't treat them nice. And they feel insecure. And so when they're preaching, they build a castle around them. That, that pulpit is a castle where it's a place where they can have authority, where they can be protected by the, the hurts of the world. And they build a castle around them where they can't be criticized, where they control people with their logical sermons and expository sermons and their coldness and it's because they've not been able to relax in the love of God and realize that the hurts that happened in their childhood God can minister his grace through that through their life 
And so when they get in the pulpit, and when they're ministering to people, they can have an openness and a warmth to people because they are not frightened of being hurt because they've known the ministry and the healing hand of, of, the, of a loving father in, in God. And a lot of people um, go into ministry and preaching and, and stuff. Some people, some preachers go because they can't make it in the real world for whatever reason. Uh, I'm not judging them. But some people can go into the ministry thinking it's a place to hide. And... Some do that. Some go into the preaching ministry to hide. I'm not saying you are doing that. But I'm just saying that sometimes, even if we're not going into the ministry to hide from the world, we can be using the ministry to hide from the world. We can be caught up in wanting to preach, wanting to change the world. But in a way, we're running away from our pain. We're, it's a way of running away from our pain. A way of escaping from the hurts and the pains that we have from the past. But God is gracious. God knows that. God knows where you're at. And, and all he wants you to do is just say, Lord, I... I have got these hurts, I have got these concerns, I have got these worries. And I want to be an effective preacher. I want to be a preacher that is powerful for you, Lord. That, that is making a mark for you, Lord. That is bringing glory to you. I want, I want to be in the Spirit, Lord. But I, I have these hang-ups. I am screwed up in some areas of my life. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, work through me, please. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, bring healing to me. And he's gracious. He's a gracious God. He's a gentle God and he's a gracious God. I know I've talked a lot about he cuts you down, but th that that's reserved for the men who want to really serve the Lord. If you want to serve the Lord, you've got to come under the knife more than anybody else. But he's gentle and he's caring and he and he's kind and and he knows that that you have hang-ups. He knows that you have worries. He knows that you have concerns. And and he, he just like a, a five-year-old kid would. Um. What can I say? five-year-old kid at night uh, sat in the front room and the granddad is there I, I've done this when I was a kid and the granddad is on the chair and it's a well, uh, you know fire and it's a little bit dark and you go and sit next to your granddad and the granddad just gives you a hug and just makes you feel everything's okay so that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to do that with you. He wants you to know that the hang-ups that you've had about your parents or your past or or your relationships or whatever. He just wants you to know that he's there, that he loves you, that he cares for you. And that he's with you. And that everything's going to be alright. That he ain't going to let you go. He ain't going to let you fall away. And he's going to take you through. And in your call, and in the silence, and as you meditate on the love of God and your relationship with the love of God, which is the foundation of your preaching and your pastoral ministry, everybody's got a demon voice. It's that demon voice. That will tell you something that you do not want to hear. But it will be the voice that wants to destroy you. It is the voice that wants to destroy you. And it comes to you. 
and it speaks to you and if you listen to it it brings you down and it destroys you it might be the voice of you'll never come to anything it might be the voice that you're an idiot it might be the voice of there you go again you made the mistake it might be the voice of you'll never find love in your life it might be the voice you'll never find love again or whatever there'll be voices in your head and the voices will tell you even before you go into the ministry during the ministry and these voices will be there telling you time and time again bringing this negative issue that's always been there in your life bringing you down pulling you down it will come and it will come and it will come and as a friend said that is what the devil wants for you that is what the devil wants for you the devil wants you wants you to believe those words he wants to bring you down he want he's got things in store for you that and, and, and he had things in store for your life he wanted to take your life down and that's where he wanted to bury you under the mound of despair and to bury you that's what he wanted for you but God had a different idea and saved you but as you get saved you still got that mentality that voice of the devil that comes and the devil tries to exploit it through situations to trigger that voice off again in your head you'll never amount to nothing you're a nobody you're nothing it'll never sort out or whatever it is where is God here or there'll be a voice and it will be the demon voice that one voice that goes right to the heart of your heart into your life and always triggers you to the point where if you listen to it it takes you out and the way to fight that voice is to meditate and appropriate and ask God to show you for God demonstrates his love to us it for in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us to ask God to give you a sense of his love through Christ to understand what Christ has done for you and to meditate on it and to be secure in his love so when that voice that demon voice comes you say no 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 my father loves me he cares for me the voice say you'll never amount to nothing and you say well might be according to you devil but according to my God he loves me you've got to go and have a talk to him because he says he loves me and if he says he loves me that's good enough for me and we've got to talk back to the devil and we've got to talk back to him with the word of God and we've got to tell him that God tells us something different than he tells us he might tell us we're a waste of space he might te tell us we've made mistakes he might tell us all the things under the sun but we've got to turn back the word of God on him and say no 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 God loves me God cares for me God is here for me God is my father and he's called me to the ministry and he's with me and he loves me like you're no good you keep failing you sinner yeah I am but God says all things work together for good he says he forgives he says he's with me he says that I, I am his and he is my father and I'm trusting in him go away basically think about the love of God and about your relationship with God as your father that's where all the pastoral problems come in your ministry as a preacher is because you as a preacher have not experienced or understand and need more of an experience of the love of God the more understanding that you have of the love of God in your life the more at peace you'll be and the better preacher you'll be and that is the foundation of your call your, your, the foundation of your call is that so when a time is unsure in your life about where you go in your ministry meditate on the love of God keep meditating on it and don't let the devil take control of your thought and put in your thought that demon voice that one voice 
that triggers off the despair of the discouragement and the depression in your life okay well, we're going to stop there and we'll do another video and uh, I hope this has been a blessing to you